Welcome to Prepare the Way, a show dedicated to all matters related to the new evangelization. I am your host, Martha Fernandez Sardina, Director of the Office for Evangelization of the Archdiocese of San Antonio and of Prepare the Way Enterprises, a ministry dedicated to helping Catholics become everyday evangelized evangelizers. I have as my guest today on the first part of a series, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. He comes to us from Oregon on the West Coast. He is a deacon, he is a speaker, he is the host of several series on EWTN, and he is an evangelizer at heart. So we're blessed to have him back. Welcome back, Deacon. Thank you, Martha. So great to be here with you again. It's good to have you. We had some time ago a four-part series on the Word of God in the life and the mission of the church with you, Verbum Domini, mm -hmm. which uh, people can inquire about by contacting the Office for Evangelization. But now let's talk about this exciting time that we're living in. We have the Synod of Bishops coming up in October, the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization for the transmission of the Christian faith. We have the Year of Faith, which the Holy Father has spoken about in Porta Fide. And we have, of course, a society that increasingly is showing signs of losing their faith, the faith. Pope Benedict XVI himself talks about crisis of faith that we're living in. Are you excited about this time to reach out to people with the gospel? I'm very excited, Martha. I mean, I, I think this is one of the greatest times in the history of the church to be Catholic. Mm. I mean, because we're, you know, we're sometime now more than 50 years or about or just about 50 years after the, the Second Vatican Council. And I really think, you know, it's, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. After every council, there's a period of people trying to figure out what the council was really about. We are past that now. Uh, we've had great Pope saints, like hopefully Pope uh, you know, uh, John Paul II, mm -hmm. uh, who really helped to uh, move forward this new evangelization, following in the footsteps of Pope Paul VI. So I think Pope, the Holy Spirit moved Paul VI at the Second Vatican Council to begin the conversation of how do we take the richness and beauty and truth of our faith, really the person of Jesus Christ, and to transmit that truth to the entire world. Because there was a sense, I think, that the Vatican was kind of, was, was kind of insular. Mm. And I think the Holy Spirit, the Second Vatican Council, says, okay, now we need to break this message to the entire world. So I think the documents reflect that. Mm -hmm. I think Pope Paul VI reflect that. And most assuredly, Pope John Paul II, and now Pope Benedict XVI, are all emphasizing this evangelization. They recognize that we're in a period now where the Holy Spirit is moving or can move powerfully mm -hmm. through Holy Mother Church. And it's up to all of us, all of us, to be that evangelizing witness to the world. You, you, you touch on so many important themes because uh, in this document, Apostolic Letter Porta Fide on the uh, year of faith that Pope Benedict uh, uh, has promulgated, he speaks precisely of the fact that he has announced this year of faith to be uh, coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council and also the 20th anniversary of the promulgation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And he called, of course, uh, which our viewers and listeners already know because of other shows, he's called together a synod of bishops on the new evangelization for the transmission of the Christian faith. And one of my favorite documents is precisely Evangelii Nunciandi on evangelization in the modern world in which Pope Paul VI, back in 1975, spoke so clearly about this need for, he called it a new period of evangelization. I published an article titled Implementing the New Evangelization Now and Then, not that you do it just now and then, but now, and how did we do it before? And I just want to refresh our memory, our historic memory, so to speak, on some of the things that, that, that the church has been saying, like you said. Uh, and you touched on something that's very important. You said the Holy Spirit is moving or can move, and the can is whether or not we contribute exactly. to it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Paul VI right. already talked about that. He said in, uh, in Evangelium Luciani, he spoke of a need, the need for a new Pentecost that would usher in a new period of evangelization. He talked about the fact that we need to take into account the new order of things. That's what makes the new evangelization new. It's not a new gospel, but the new order of things, the new happenings, the, the, the new world that we're living in. And he said, at every phase of human history, the church constantly gripped by the desire to evangelize, has but one preoccupation, whom to send to proclaim the mystery of Jesus. In what way is this mystery to be proclaimed? And how can one assure that it will resound and reach all those sh who should hear it? 
That's what he was saying already in 1975. How shall we proclaim it? Who shall we send? And how do we ensure that people are touched and transformed by that gospel? That's right. And the, and the Pope led the way. He started traveling to other countries to bring the message of the gospel. Mm -hmm. so, and he's traveled more than any pope before him. And then, of course, Pope John Paul II, who traveled millions mm -hmm. of miles bringing the message of the gospel. And Pope Benedict XVI is also traveling quite extensively as well. So they're, they're putting the faith into practice. They're saying, mm -hmm. look, let, take, follow my lead here. Let's all go out and let's proclaim this. Now, people have to go all, the, all around the world, but you know, starting with your own family, mm -hmm. in your own parish community, mm -hmm. in your workplace, wherever you find yourself, not being afraid to be a witness and to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, nowadays with our cell phones, our computers, all the gadgets we have, the devices, we can actually go to the ends of the earth. We can literally send a evangelistic message through Facebook, Twitter, uh, any social media site, uh, text messaging, and so forth, which you might recall that when the World Youth Day took place in Australia, the Pope was texting, not literally the Pope, but somebody on the Pope's behalf, texting all the youth who were there. So we can use even these modern means of communication. As Pope Paul VI said, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the church is actually in favor of using whatever is not against the gospel in order to promote the gospel. Amen. You're exactly right. And you, you touched on something very important, the, the, the changing world of the developing world. So think about the issues that we're dealing with now that were just on the cusp when Pope Paul VI wrote Evangelii Nuntianti. For example, uh, abortion has just become legalized in the United States, the slaughtering of innocent children. Uh, euthanasia, mm -hmm. which is now, at least in the United States and where I live in Oregon, and now in our neighboring state of Washington is now law. A doctor can prescribe a lethal dose of medication so you can kill yourself. Wow. Um, and that's legal now in at least two states in, in the United States. Um, embryonic stem cell research. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, things that, you know, technology, we're not, uh, technological wise, we're not being able to be done, but are now realities. Mm -hmm. How do we respond to that mm -hmm. with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Um, and I think that's the important witness that the church has to make. Say, okay, this is who we are, always recognizing the dignity of the human person. Always recognize that we are still made in the image and likeness of God. And technology should help to, um, to build up and to uh, recognize the, the specialness of humanity and the human person. Not to degrade it, not to use it as an object, mm -hmm. um, not to use it as a piece of material for research. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gospel has to speak powerfully. And that's why I'm so glad to see uh, documents like what you're talking about in the Year of Faith and all these wonderful initiatives that the church is helping us to, to move forward uh, in our way of thinking and acting and, and being as Catholics in the world today. And, and what you've mentioned, some of those uh, developments over the last 20, 30 years and some of them within the last year or two, and, and life is at, moving at a fast pace. There are developments. I heard someone say on the radio the other day, I found it so cute. She said, this is not the world that I grew up in. And she added, and I'm only 27. And she laughed. And she was making a profound statement that even a person who is only in their 20s can notice the difference between the world as it is today and the world that she grew up in. You know, just 10 years ago, she was still at home. And, and the, uh, the popes have talked about that. And if, if back in 1975, um, Pope Paul VI was calling for a new evangelization in these various areas, look at something he mentioned, uh, which sometimes people don't recognize. He Even back then, uh, let me see if I can put my finger on it. He talked about the issue of religious freedom, which ah, has now yes. become such a hot topic in our own country. Um, and he said that, we, that the evangelization of the world entails a respect for all relig uh, for all rights human rights at, at and the one of the formal for uh, first and foremost rights of a, of a person is that of religious freedom and don't we see that under attack in our own nation and in so many nations of the world uh, that's correct you know um uh, one, one of the things that we really need to understand and exactly right we have a, a freedom to express our religious beliefs and ideologies um just because we don't agree with someone 
doesn't mean we have the right to suppress their ability to express their religious belief. Um, that's a fundamental tenet, tenet on which this country was, was built and formed. And, and as we see this slowly beginning to slip away um, around the world, now we, we see it in our own country. Mm -hmm. And so we really do need to stand up and, and to understand what is at stake here. I mean, and, and the beautiful thing about it, we have non-Christians and even some atheists who are standing mm -hmm. with the church. I mean, I, there was one pastor that once said, we're all Catholic now. He wasn't Catholic, oh, you know, and because he's saying we mm -hmm. need to stand up with the church on this issue because, hey, we could be next. Exactly. You know, uh, uh, this is a, a, a great example of the way the church uh, thinks and has always, I'm looking here at the beginning of this apostolic exhortation, and this one doesn't use this phrase, but many of the papal documents use the term and people of goodwill. This one is directed, apostolic exhortation of His Holiness Pope John Paul, uh, I mean Pope Paul VI, to the episcopate, that's the bishops, the clergy, that's priests and deacons, and to all the faithful of the entire world. But many of the documents are directed, it adds, and to people of goodwill. Why? Because of what you just pointed out, that even people who do not share our religious beliefs can share our view of the human rights of a human person to know that there's something majorly wrong when religious freedom is suppressed. This is what I found the quote here, by the way, it's number 39. Pope Paul VI said, the necessity of ensuring fundamental human rights cannot be separated from this just liberation. He had been speaking about the liberation of man, which is bound up with the evangelization, with evangelization and which endeavors to secure structures safeguarding human freedoms. And he goes on to say, among these fundamental human rights, religious liberty occupies a place of primary importance. Why is it so essential to the new evangelization? Because it's an affront against the human person, and we as believers need to make sure that we are permeating society with gospel values at every level, which is what the bishops are now saying in the lineamenta for the upcoming uh, synod of bishops, those six sectors, uh, economy, civic and political life, technological and scientific research, um, family, and a couple of others that they've mentioned in here, That's social, right. mass, mass media. That's right. And, and you hit on something that's very important, and it's a connection that we really need to make, and it's the natural law. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's really what religious liberty is, uh, is about, respecting the natural law. Now, of course, the natural law is, um, uh, is where we can come to know the truth of who God is by reason alone. Uh, Pope, uh, Pope <laughs> St. Paul talks about this very clearly in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, mm -hmm. um, where we can come to know who God is by reason alone. And the conscience is the practical application of the basic principle of natural law, which is do good and avoid evil. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in the Second Vatican Council it talked about, it, it was addressing, you know, Catholics, but then it addressed, you know, uh, Christians who are not uh, Catholics. It talked about uh, those who believe in God mm -hmm. and those who are still seeking, those who are mm -hmm. searching. Those, and so the language that the Post is using now is just reflecting the language of natural law. Exactly. You know? There's a and beautiful continuity exactly. in all these concepts. We're going to go to a quick break. When we come back, we are going to get into this a little further and equip you to carry out your role, your part, in the new evangelization. Don't go away. We'll be right back. There was no single event. It was more gradual. You know, eventually you just don't go one Sunday and then you don't go two Sundays in a row. Then went through a divorce and... Uh, ended up being a single parent. If I didn't have church or God, I, I, I would be back at that lonely stage, that trouble stage. Whenever you get anxious and worry about things, you just know that Jesus has it under control. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org. I went to church and just sat there and listened. I really didn't absorb anything. I think I just found myself believing that I didn't need God. I just had everything under control, and church was actually a, a burden to me. I had this sin that I carried in my heart for a long time, and I told myself for many, many years that the Lord wouldn't forgive me for this. When, when Father in the confessional says, your sins are forgiven, there truly is a, a feeling of, of weight lifted off. I don't care if it's two or three little sins that you're carrying, there's a feeling of I can breathe deeply again. I feel pure inside. And I'm, and I'm ready to come to Mass. You can have a beautiful car, a big fancy home. If you don't have Christ in your life, there's an emptiness that's there. 
when you come home to the, to the church, you're coming home to a Catholic family where people today just embrace you. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Welcome back to Prepare the Way. I'm your host, Martha Fernandez Sardina, with my guest, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Like Rivers. I have to remind <laughs> myself because <laughs> sometimes I want to say Sivers. The four, six, I'm sorry, the six sectors that the Lineamenta, which is the first document that is prepared by the Vatican for a Synod of Bishops, the Lineamenta for the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization for the Transmission of the Christian Faith, which our Archbishop Gustavo, in fact, is going to be attending. He'll be one of four representatives from the uh, United States Episcopal Conference. It has six sectors, and this is very important for us to keep these in mind because sometimes when we talk about the new evangelization, Deacon, people forget how important what we do in the world is to the new evangelization. I said in a show with uh, Archbishop Gustavo some time ago that what we profess on Sunday must be related to what we live on Monday. We have to go out into the world. That's the whole point. The first sector is culture, how the, the modern culture, the, the, the society that we're living in, the values that we're passing on, the lifestyles that are being promoted. That's the first sector. Second, social sector, everything, the intercommunication and, and, and dependence, interdependence of nations, for example. The third sector, sector the means of social communications, television, radio, internet, you name it. Uh, fourth sector, economy, how we move goods and resources and, 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 and exchange uh, goods with others. Fifth sector, scientific and technological research. And you made uh, reference to several uh, things in that area. And sixth, the civic and political life. Sometimes people say the church has no business talking about uh, politics. What the church or leaders within the church may not do is use a pulpit, for example, for partisan politics. But all Catholics and all believers should be involved in civic and political life, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we talk about our Catholic faith is a dignity of the human person, which is the whole person in every place that we find ourselves. Um, and we have to remember, a lot of these issues aren't really political issues. They're life issues or family issues that mm -hmm. have become politicized. Right. And so we have to have our voices in there, mm -hmm. uh, in the public square to be able to, uh, to, to talk about what does it mean to be a human person where we're confronted with so many, as you said, so many uh, quick um, technological advances and changes. And, you know, um, and we really need to be able to speak openly and deeply and freely about who we are, who God created us to be, what it means to be a, a human person, how do we respect the dignity and the rights of all human beings who are made in God's image and likeness, not just Christians. Mm -hmm. And so the principles that we espouse as a Catholic Church are principles that respect the rights and dignities of others, no matter what religion they are, no matter where in the world they are. And that's, I think, is something so uh, beautifully unique about the gospel because it, you know, it, it applies to the, the fundamental principles apply to everyone mm -hmm. and not just to uh, Christians per se. You know, you, you touched on, uh, on something that's very important that people understand, um, and that is that God has a plan, or as uh, Blessed John Paul II used to speak of the truth about, the truth about the human person. So that's all human beings, the truth about family, the truth about marriage, the truth about sexuality. And, and before the break, you mentioned uh, Romans and, and, and the formation of conscience. And that's why I appreciate so much, too, when you talk about, when we talk about conscience, that the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, the USCCB, has uh, relaunched their document on forming consciences for faithful citizenship. And the four words are important, mm -hmm. forming consciences for faithful citizenship. In other words, what is God saying in the most uh, holiest of sanctuaries, which is that of our conscience? What is God's law saying to us so that in fact we might then engage as faithful, faithful to God, citizens in all areas of society? That's right. And uh, you bring up a point that's so important because a lot of people think, well, I'm not going to allow the church to tell me what to do. I want to think for myself. 
How often have we heard mm -hmm. that? But here's, here's, a, here's the dilemma. The people that say that, they don't realize. Because what they're saying is, I don't want the, t my conscience to be formed by a church. And they think of all of these, quote, unquote, negative things the church has done throughout history or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, but they say, well, I'm going to just figure it out by myself. But what they fail to realize is that if the church doesn't help to form your conscience with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the truth of what it means to be a human person, then the culture is going to do it. Mm -hmm. You keep saying, I'm going to do it by myself. But then who, if, how, do you, how do you go about actually doing that? Mm -hmm. You allow yourself to be influenced by all of these other things in the culture, mm -hmm. which actually uh, dehumanize us. Um, which, uh, you know, in a sense, bring us down a notch from who God created us to be. I, I like that you've, wor again, the emphasis on the word form, because people don't realize that we are formed, we're shaped, we are influenced by forces and, and, and views and worldviews and perspectives. And you're so right, if we're not allowing ourselves to be formed, molded, shaped, by the Lord and his truth, then any number of things can happen. As it says right here in Romans 1 that you're referring to, it says that it, because they claimed, look at this, Romans 1, they claimed to be wise, but they turned instead into fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images representing mortal men, birds, beasts, and snakes. In consequence, because they didn't allow themselves to be formed by God, God delivered them up to their lusts, to, in their lust to unclean practices. And then he goes on to talk about several things. Because they could have known the law of the Lord, which is even, he says, in there, written on our hearts. Uh, but they ignored it, and a lot of people are doing that today. And those are individuals, and those are sectors of society that we're called to evangelize, to bring the truth about the human person, the truth about family, the truth about marriage, the truth about economics and politics and so forth. Yeah, you know, and that's a very important point because people think, that the culture is what makes them free. Mm. You know, they think, well, the church with all its rules and regulations and commandments and catechisms and moral codes, those things restrict your freedom. And it's the culture where you can, where truth is whatever you decided to be. And look at the cultural affirmations that we have. That may be true for you, mm. but that's not true for me. That may be your truth, but that's not my truth. Or my, my personal favorite as of late, uh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, of course, these are not your favorites right, unless right, right. And, <laughs> and listeners misunderstand. But these yeah, are the right. things we hear out there. Th these are the things that yeah. we hear all the time. And, and so the, the thinking is, you know, um, I, I make up my own rules as I go along. Truth is like Plato. It can be manipulated mm -hmm. and changed at will. There is no objective truth. There are no they things that, in and tru that, that, that are things uh, true in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. That I can make truth up as I go along. And they think that that makes them free. Mm -hmm. But what actually is the case is that those things uh, actually, they become enslaved to. The very things that they think are making them free, they become enslaved to. Mm -hmm. And the, it's the, the teachings of our church and our faith, uh, who is not just a set of rules, but is a person mm -hmm. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Truth is a dynamic relationship with the living God. And when we're living in the truth of who God calls us to be, then we can be truly free to be the people who God created and calls us to be. That's where our true freedom lies. You know, I appreciate you saying this because the image that comes to mind is from uh, one of any number of movies on the passion of the Lord, whether the passion of the Christ or uh, Jesus Nazareth, whichever one. And you have that biblical scene where Pilate, Pontius Pilate, stands before Jesus and says, what is truth? He is standing in the very face of he who called himself the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, what's truth? And that's what's happening in society today. And that's why um, uh, it is so important that we bring, we facilitate a process by which people can bring themselves, by the grace of God, to a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, and accept him fully as the Lord of their lives. You know, we hear sometimes evangelicals and Protestants say, uh, have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I would want every Catholic in the world to be able to say, absolutely, he is my Lord and my Savior. Mm -hmm. He is my way, the truth, my truth, and he is my life. Amen. There's no question about it. You said that so beautifully. And uh, what I like about tying in the new evangelization with all of this, and the analogy I like to use is like a violin. You know, the culture would look at the violin and see a string on there and say, that, that string is not free. It's too constrained by the body of the violin. Look how tight that string is on there. We have to go and loosen that string up. 
And so we'd go and loosen the string and, and take the string off and put it next to the violin and say, see, now that string is now free. It's no longer constrained by the body of the violin or its rules or regulations. It's now free to do whatever it wants. And what is it free to do? Nothing. Nothing. The string is completely useless. Wow, that's a powerful and, image. And so what happens is, what, what people begin to realize when they live in the culture long enough, they start living the truth whatever you want. Mm -hmm. They start to understand that living a life of tr when truth and freedom was whatever you decided to be, you end up living a life like that string, mm -hmm. a life of emptiness, uselessness, nothingness. Mm -hmm. So what is the truth? Now, from the Catholic perspective, we look and say, well, wait a minute, that string is not free at all. It can't do anything. Mm -hmm. We would understand it's only when that string is tethered to the body of the violin. It is only when that string is tuned to the perfect pitch it was created. And it is only when that string is played in harmony with the other strings mm -hmm. that now the whole instrument has purpose mm -hmm. and meaning and beauty. See? And so we, we are the string. So we allow the richness and the beauty and the truth of the teachings of our Catholic faith to tune us mm -hmm. to the perfect pitch for which we were created. And because we're, we're not... We don't live in a culture of radical individualism. It's all about me and what I want. Pa St. Paul says we're all part of the body of Christ. That's what evangelization is about. That's why we play in harmony with the other strings. Because it's not about me. It's about us. It's about the family of God. And how do we take this precious good news of Jesus Christ and speak to anybody, everybody in every place, in every situation where we find ourselves about who God is. And sometimes people think evangelization, they make it too hard. They think, I have to change somebody's mind. If I give them this Scott Hahn track, if I give them this book, if I give them this, you know, but really all this is having a conversation about the, the, the power of Jesus Christ in your life can begin the conversation uh, where somebody desires to go deeper because now they see your personal relationship with Christ. Well, Deacon, you are a preacher and you're fired up and we're going to have to end this conversation. Can I have you back for another show? Absolutely. And we'll talk about how you and I, dear brothers and sisters, can allow the master violinist to tune us and make us play the songs that he wishes to hear in tune with others. Until we meet again with Deacon Harold, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile upon you, gracious to you. May he show you his countenance and grant you his peace.